You know, in politics there are a lot of words and sometimes those words lose meaning, like words like courage. We talk a lot about courage. Those of us who have been in politics, who watch politics a long time, have seen a lot of politicians come and go. Let's be honest, a lot of them have disappointed us. And then there are those politicians who, like Paul Ryan said, go into public service because they want to do something, not because they want to be something. Now, as a talk show host, as you know, I am seldom at a loss for words. What I have to do now requires few words. We hear a lot about hope, change, and courage. Realize how much change we have seen in the state of Wisconsin. Real, fundamental change, We're not talking about change, real change. Realize how much courage it has taken to make those changes and to put up with the, the backlash to those changes. The courage from the members of the legislature, the courage from family members, the courage from people like the First Lady, Tonette Walker, and the family of the, of, of the, of, of the government. forget that the people who we are looking to make these changes are people who need support, who need encouragement, who every day think, is it worth it? Are you behind me? Are you with me? So with very few words, no one in the state of Wisconsin embodies real hope, real change, or real courage with our next speaker, the governor of the state of Wisconsin, Scott Walker. down in South Milwaukee, and then I went over to Kramer Brothers, uh, a, a construction company over in Plain in Richland County. The reason I stopped at both of those is because of something that's incredibly important. It's on the flag right behind me. Not this flag, although I'll talk about that flag in a second, but this flag, the flag of the state of Wisconsin. Both of those companies build things that help people mine things, and that's part of our state's heritage. To, do, uh, to help instruct a few of our friends in the legislature, many of the friends in the assembly and a number of friends in the Senate have already prepared and have already taken action on this, but we want to make sure between now and the next couple of weeks when the legislature ends its session, we have an opportunity in this state, the state to not only help the northwest side of Wisconsin, Iron County, ultimately create 200, excuse me, 700 jobs minimum in the first phase, almost twice as many in the second phase of jobs, right at that mine site in Iron County. But when you think about Caterpillar, when you think about PNH, when you think about Monarch Corporation in the northwest side of Milwaukee, or the two companies I mentioned today, or the hundreds like them around the state, it is clear that there's anywhere from 1,000 in the first phase to 2,300 jobs in the second phase that we can see in the state. But it's not just about the jobs, you see, it's about the state's history. The other day when the president was in town and that flag and that flag was up, 
I understand one of the media outlets got confused and thought 1848 was the name of the local. It's not. That's the year that our state was founded. And for more years than we've been a state, we had a great history and heritage of mining in this state. You see, on that flag, if you pull it out, you can see the face right there. One of the two guys standing there, he's a miner. If you open up the seal, you take a look at the seal, one of the four quadrants has a pickaxe and a shovel. That's for mining. And most importantly, if you look at the top, right below the words forward, what do you see? What animal do you see on our flag? Badger. Now, I'm a hunter like a lot of you here, and I gotta tell you, everywhere when I go hunting, I hardly ever see any badgers. <laughs> It's because our state's not necessarily filled with any more badgers than Iowa or Minnesota or uh, Michigan or Illinois or anywhere else out there. The reason we're the badger state is not because there's a lot of badgers in this state. It's because more than 160 years ago, when people would come to the southwest part of the state, nearby where I was at time, you know where it is, not too far from Colroy, just a little bit further south below there, over by where the University of Wisconsin Platteville is, there's a big M on the mound. Yes. doesn't stand for Mineral Point down the way where my mom and dad used to have an aunt and uncle at a farm down the way. It doesn't stand for flying the other direction going upside down for Wisconsin. It stands for mining. Because the University of Wisconsin Platteville used to be the mining school. If there's any place in America should, that should be able to streamline the process for safe and environmentally sound mining, it is the state of Wisconsin. It is about time we claim our heritage. Now, I, I want to I want to tell you about a couple other quick things tonight and ask for your help. But then you've had a full night. You've got some great folks here. You've got one of the best, not just in our state, but literally one of the best states, United States senators in the entire uh, delegation. <laughs> And we're gonna we're gonna send him an ally come this November yes. to make sure we got two. <laughs> first off, I, I want to say thank you. And Charlie kind of alluded to this, but Tonette and I uh, get asked all the time, "How do you put up with the grief? You know, how do you put up with all the chaos?" Many of you know along the way over the past year, some of you live nearby us. We've seen it. The thousands of people were busted in front of our home over here in Wauwatosa. You've seen it along the way. You've seen the people who not only do that, the, the folks who, the, the protesters who go around and chase my kids on Facebook, the, the grief that not only my parents uh, or my family gets, but my mother, who's in her 70s, and my youngest son, Alex, once at a grocery store, and someone chased him down the aisle and yelled the two of them out there. People say, how do you put up with it? He says, it's real simple. I hear it all the time. I heard I just came from out of Gamey County's Lincoln Day Dinner where I was with ton of folks, but one of them, our Lieutenant Governor Rebecca Clayfish, said to pass on a kind word. Yeah, she's staying up there to talk about our agenda as well, but I, I heard it as we went in and talked to people there. I heard it even at some of the factories and forges I was at today. I, I get people all the time, not just at Republican events, not just at Chamber of Commerce events, but when I go to factories and farms and businesses around the state, they don't own the banners, they don't own signs, they don't chant. They just quietly come up and say, Governor, we're praying for you and your family. And I can't tell you that means. That ultimately makes a world of difference to us, and that's how we persevere. For everyone that's obnoxious that you see on TV, there's tenfold out there that quietly and respectfully say, you know what? We're lifting up your prayers, we support you, we appreciate what you're doing, and that's what allows us to move forward. We appreciate this, so thank you. Thank you. We've got a great story to tell here in Wisconsin. We've got an outstanding story to tell, but I, I want to I wanna ask one group of people to stand up and, and join me for just one second. I, I'd like to ask all the members of the legislature here tonight, all the Republicans in the Assembly and the Senate to stand up for us right now. Let's give them a big round of applause. Tonight and in the days to come, 
between now and November, and in one particular case, just down the way in Racine County, between now and late this summer, uh, late this spring, early summer, depending on what day it is. Uh, Van Weingarten in particular, you need to remember. But you need to remember all of them. Van's right there. But you need to understand that as much as Rebecca Clayfish and I stood up and took a courageous stand, every one of those men and women you just saw and everyone else that joined them with the Assembly and the Senate took an equally courageous stand for the taxpayers. For the taxpayers of the state, and you cannot let them down. We need to stand with them just as much as you're standing with us. And in particular, in this area, even though it's just outside of Milwaukee County, we need to make sure that as much as you can, you help out Van Wangard because that would be a tremendously negative loss, not for our party, not just for this region, but for the entire state and the country. If we gained or retained the governorship, the lieutenant governorship of the state, but somehow lost any one of those courageous state senators, and Van is the one right in your backyard, we need to keep Van Wangard in the state senate. So make sure you stay back. to risk any of this because we got a great story to tell. Think about it. You know, when, when I ran for governor and somebody in this room helped me out, and I appreciate that, and in some ways I'm uh, almost apologetic to Annette and I often say we're apologetic to be back at it two years later asking for your help and your support and your enthusiasm again, but, but it's obviously not our doing, it's somebody else's doing, we appreciate your willingness to help us out. But we've got a great story to tell. When I ran for governor, I, I viewed it as a, a job interview. I spent 18 months interviewing for the job of being CEO of the state of Wisconsin. And in doing so, I went around this state and said, you know what, we face an economic and a fiscal crisis. And then I told people what we do to fix it. You all heard it. Nobody here is surprised. For eight years, I told you what I do as your county executive. And each and every time I did it, should it be any surprise as governor, I do exactly what I said on the campaign trail. We didn't wait a year or six months or even a month. You saw it not just from us, but from the men and women who stood up and the others liked them around the state. We tackled that issue right off the bat. Right off the bat. We, we made a fundamental difference, lowering the tax burden of job creators, easing the regulatory burden to cut through the red tape so small businesses can move forward, cutting back on the cost of frivolous lawsuits, even repealing the state tax and health savings cuts. We did all those things right off the bat. Right off the bat. We send a powerful, powerful message that we say Wisconsin's open for business. We need business, and the best way you help businesses grow jobs is getting government out of the way so employers can work. And the good news is it's working. I mean, think about it. People in the media tend to forget about this, but in the three years before we took office, before I took the oath of office, before the new majorities, before we had a new speaker and a new majority leader and others out there, in those three years before 2010, we lost 150,000 private sector jobs under the old administration and the old majorities. In the past year, with new policies and a new agenda, we've gained thousands of new jobs. Our employment rate is down from the year ago. In fact, it's the lowest it's been since 2008, before the full effect of the recession. That's a story that should be on the front page of the newspaper. And the great news is we've got a great opportunity for the future. Think about it. Think about it out there. It's not just that the unemployment numbers are down. It's not just that we're heading the right direction, creating jobs. The people of this state who create jobs, not the government, the people. People are surveyed every year, the, the job creators of this great state. Two years ago, before we took office, only 10% thought we were heading in the right direction. Last month, same survey, same, same uh, question asked of job creators in this state, do you think Wisconsin's heading in the right direction? We went from 10% two years ago, where do you think we were last month? 94% said we're heading in the right direction. So I want to know what the heck's wrong with those other 6%. I'm going to find them out and figure out what's wrong, get them on the right path again. But the reality is the strong majority of those surveyed also said they want to grow their business in 2012. And that's a great opportunity for the future. That's something we can build off. Now, we also knew that to get the economy going again, it didn't just mean creating a better business environment. 
it meant being responsible in tackling our fiscal crisis as well. The great news is while nearly every state in America had a budget deficit, we said, we said ultimately we were going to make the poor decisions that you saw in the last year in other states, not the least of which is our neighbors to the south in Illinois. In fact, I was with Charlie the other day and we were at the, the business session with job creators from across the state of Wisconsin. I introduced my economic team. In fact, I introduced a new member of our team, some of the many of you know from, from Milwaukee County, Tim Sullivan, who used to be the CEO of Osiris, is now working as my special counsel uh, on economic development and workforce development. And as I introduced the team, of course, all the job creators were impressed with it. And I said, oh, by the way, I think I forgot one guy I should thank for being a part of my economic team as well. His name's Pat Quinn. He's the governor of Illinois. Uh, because you look at what Governor Quinn has done in that state. Remember last year at this time when they faced a deficit just like we did? Just like just about every state in the country did. Governor Quinn proudly said in Springfield, we're not going to do what Wisconsin's doing. But clearly he did not. In the last year, you can see the difference. I mean, a year ago at this time, they raised taxes on, on individuals 67% in the land of Lincoln. That would make Lincoln roll over in his grave. They raised taxes on businesses 46%. And a year later, they have a budget mess that's even bigger than the one they inherited. I mean, look at it. They're proposing cutting $2 billion in Medicaid, even while we added money to Medicaid to care for seniors and needy families and children. They're in an opportunity now where their, their bond rate just got lowered to the worst in the country. Even Jerry Brown in California looks better than Illinois. These days. <laughs> They have a pension system that's only half funded, while ours is 100% funded. I mean, on every measure out there, their unemployment rate is nearly 10% in Illinois. On every measure out there, we fare better because they made poor decisions that was about more spending, more taxes, and more government in Illinois. We showed the best way to get your economy going and to get your budget truly balanced is to put the power back in the hands of the people, not in the hands of the government. Other states laid off thousands of public employees. Still other states cut core services like Medicaid, and many states, unfortunately, chose to do what Wisconsin had done all too often in the past couple of years, and that's use budget givings. Instead, we chose long-term structural reforms, things that balance not only our state budget, but help our local government balance budgets for years to come. As I like to say often to the state capitol, we thought more about the next generation than we did about the next election. And isn't that what you elected us to do? Yeah. Now, we did all those things not only to balance the budget, to get our fiscal house to work. We did it ultimately because it was good for the economy, too. You see, when people choose to invest in our state, when they're already here, they got good companies like Ron's and others out here, when they, when they look to grow or a new company comes in here, they want to know, is this place stable? Remember last year, in the thick of all this, about this time, I think it was March, actually, of, of 2011, I was asked by a reporter from Reuters, who actually asked me a pretty good question, which is unusual from the media. Uh, and he said, you know, he was walking through all the chaos coming in and out of the Capitol, and he's, you could hear the pounding of the drums and the horn going off, and he said, well, Governor, you know, my, my readers actually are investors, and they don't like instability. How can you tell them this is a good place to invest in? That's a great question. But see, you have it 180 degrees wrong. Because what you see happening in the capital at that time, and maybe in a handful of other places around the state, what you see there is momentary political unrest. But what it leads to is long-term financial stability. That makes this the best place in the world to invest in. Because we're one of the few places in the world where we understand how to put our fiscal house in order and how to empower both our state and our local governments to control their destinies for generations to come. This makes this a great place to invest in, to grow jobs in, to build an economy in. That's exactly why we did it. It wasn't just to balance the budget. It was to ultimately make our state a better place in which to create jobs. Now, to me though, the most important thing we did in this last year wasn't just about economic and fiscal reform. It was about government reform. It was about fundamentally making government. I, I believe in limited government. But I also believe that in the areas where government does have a legitimate role, we should demand that it's done better. 
I mean, think about it. Why is it the past there's always this false choice between higher taxes or fewer services? Any of you who own your own businesses don't make that choice. You don't say, let's double the price of my product or cut the quality in half or people run your competitor, right? You figure out a way, whether it's through lean manufacturing or total quality management, any of those other things, you use reform and efficiency and innovation to bridge the gap. So you provide a great product at a reasonable price. That's a foreign concept in government. Well, that's not anymore the case in Wisconsin. We have made fundamental changes. There's no better example of that than in education. You see, we have proven that you can both provide a great education for every kid in this state. Every kid in this state, no matter what zip code they come from, should have the opportunity to have a great education. And at the same time, we should be able to protect the taxpayers of Wisconsin. And I'll give you two good examples of how we should do that, or how we've been able to do that. You see, before our reforms, nearly every school district in this state was forced to buy their health insurance from a company from just one company because of collective bargaining, a company that was ultimately affiliated with the teachers union. Well, that cost them tens of millions of dollars more than they needed to. In our reforms and changing collective bargaining, we empowered every school district and every local government to bid things like health insurance out. And that means we've literally saved tens of millions of dollars, not just for our schools, but money that can go directly into the classroom. You see, in education, it's not about more money. It's about spending money more wisely being wiser with the use of your funds. That's what you elect us to do, to be good stewards with the taxpayer's dollars. Not to spend more, but to spend it wiser. Another great example goes beyond just spending, and it's one that happened right here. Nearly two years ago, almost to the day, there was a young woman here in the Milwaukee Public School System who was named one of the outstanding new teachers of the year. Great teacher, exactly the kind. Tony and I have got two boys who go to public high school. It's exactly the kind of person you want teaching your kids. Dynamic, exciting, they one of the best in the state. What happened to her? About a week, week and a half later, she got noticed she's going to be laid off. Why? How, how could that happen? Wonder the old collective bargaining system? Last in, first out. Last hired, first fired. What we did in our reforms, what we did in changing collective bargaining, ultimately said in this state there's no more seniority, there's no more tenure. Instead, in every school, every county, every town, every village, and in state government all across this great state. We can hire and fire based on merit. We can pay based on performance. We can put the best and the brightest in our classrooms, and we can keep them there. actually take the things in school choice and in charter schools that have been so successful in the past and empower our traditional public schools to be able to do some of the great things. Because it's great what we do with great choice schools. And it's great what we do with great charter schools. And we expanded that in this budget. We lifted it so it wasn't just low income, it was middle class families that could participate here as well. And we added other places like we're seeing. And we made it easier for charter schools. But in the end, in every school, in every part of the state, we should give that same opportunity so that every kid in every district, in every zip code, in every family can have the opportunity for a great education. And that's exactly what I was going to do. So think about that. Our reforms over the past year empowered, actually started out by doing what we said we do. No small task in politics to begin with, but Paul Ryan and I often talk about, I don't know why we get called courageous for keeping our word. Everywhere else in life you're expected to do that. Why is it that politics is the one exception? But right off the bat, we did what we said. But more important, our reforms ultimately empowered the private sector to create more jobs in the state. They ultimately put in place a plan where we made structural reforms to balance the budget without raising tax, without laying off thousands of public employees, without cutting core services, and without using budget givings. And most importantly, our reforms empowered us to make sure the government served the people and not the other way around. Those are the things that we did in the past year. To me, I think to most of you here, if not all, that sounds like a pretty good re-election campaign, right? Yeah. Promises made, promises kept. And yet here I stand just a few months away from a recall election. Why is that? It's pretty simple. I think most of you have figured this out in this room, but if you haven't, let me fill you in. It's about the money. Not about your money, 
but about what they think is their money. And what I mean by that is the big government union bosses in Washington fundamentally believe that we have taken their money away. And the reality is, it's not their money. It's not their money, it's the workers' money. The one thing we did that is unbelievably pro-worker and I think essentially freedom-based and something that this man right here would be proud to know that we did was we gave every one of the public servants in this state the nearly 300,000 good, decent, hardworking men and women in our state who wake up every day and show up in our cities and our towns and our school districts and our state government and do a great job for the people of this state. The good public servants of the state now have the right to choose whether or not they want to be in a public employee union or not. And that's what bothers the big government union bosses. Because they know in the end, if given the choice, most people are going to opt to keep their own money. That's what this is all about. That's fundamentally what That's why last year they spent tens of millions of dollars. Think about it in total. Just to go after those six Republican senators, $44 million was spent in the state. That's big money in Texas, let alone Wisconsin. $44 million was spent in Wisconsin. The majority of that was spent to defeat Republican senators. The majority, vast majority of that was spent by the big government union bosses. They have shown us they'll go to any length to try and win. Many have suggested it could be 70 to $80 million spent on the race against me and Rebecca Clayfish in this next election. 70 to $80 million. That's because they know that what's at stake here is not collective bargaining or a pension or health care contribution. It's much bigger than that. It's not even what's at stake this next November. And certainly, this race will have an impact on the presidential election in Wisconsin and across the country and the U.S. Senate election and two of our key house seats in the state. All those are critically important. What they understand is something we as conservatives need to understand as well. What's at stake is much greater than that. It's not just about the governor or lieutenant governor. It's ultimately about one simple word. From our standpoint, it's not about their money. It's about courage. You see, in the end, when we prevail, and I'm an optimist, so I believe we will prevail. I believe, when we prevail, it will send a powerful, powerful message. Not only in Madison, in our state house, but in Springfield, in St. Paul, in Columbus, in Austin, in state houses all across America. When we prevail even more so, it'll help people like Ron and Paul and others who are trying to take courageous acts to our United States Congress and transform the federal government. When we win, it will send a powerful message all across America that if you stand up and do what the people elect you to do, if you have the courage of your convictions to stand up and do what we know is right, and just and is needed in this time, not only in our state, but in our federal government. There will be people standing with you, beside you, every step of the way to encourage you and allow you to move forward and continue down that path. And Lord help us if we fail. Because if we fail, I think it sets aside any courageous action in America, not just in Wisconsin, for at least a decade, if not a generation. That is why we must not fail. That's why I'm asking for your help tonight. So there's three simple ways, and I'll close with this. You can help. People ask me all the time, how can you help? Message, manpower, and money. And in that order. You can help us with all. You can help us with some. You can help us a little bit of each. But the most important thing you can help us out with is the message. Because you see, our most important tool, the most valuable asset we have in this debate, is the truth.